Lakshmi Mpatia, uh, it's an honor to have you uh, and you'll be talking about uh, uh, finding the common ground practical uh, aspects to dialogue. Uh, a brief introduction, uh, after nearly two decades in an international corporate career with GAP Incorporation, as a global director of CSR and human rights, where she worked in the field of business and human rights. She is now working in her own passage, uh, working on her own journey of uh, self discovery. She has also worked for a number of years with adults and their care as a counselor and mentor in some of the leading schools and colleges in India. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Patia. Thank you, Bazaar. Uh, it's great to be here again. Okay. That's great. Okay, thank so you, firstly, thank you. yeah, it's firstly, a privilege thank having you. you. Thank you very much. Are you all able to hear me? Can you just give me a thumbs up sign that you can hear me? Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, um, see, there's so much happening. We're in the midst of chaos on multiple levels. Okay, this is a world which, when you look out, seems to have gone completely mad, mm, which, which is, you know, partially true. But also it is a world which is sort of, you know, um, uh, opening up to a lot of new possibilities and which is kind of what we are going to be focusing on. So before I come to that, I just want to thank Bezad and the InDialogue uh, Foundation for consistently holding the space of peace and oneness and harmony. Um, and in, in these times of noise and chaos, it takes a lot. Uh, to keep this, this what I would call a sacred space alive and afloat. So a huge thanks to you, Bezad, and others in, in your you know, um, peace building space for keeping this going. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am um, originally from South India, but um, you know, lived in North India my whole life. Um, and um, did my graduation in psychology, then my master's degree in social work uh, from Delhi School of Social Work. And I was working with a number of NGOs uh, who worked with street kids, with migrant workers. Um, and uh, then, you know, sort of destiny took me into the heart of corporate America where I joined Gap Inc., uh, you know, the clothing company Gap. Uh, in the late 90s um, to look after issues of ethical trade in the supply chain. And uh, though labor rights was not my field of expertise, this put me into the heart of labor rights because this was to do with factories from where, you know, they would source clothes and um, various issues would, would occur because these were not factories that were owned by the company but existed in at that point of time, 50 countries all over the world. Um, that journey lasted, you know, I was with GAP for 15 years and um, I was very fortunate to travel a lot. So um, to give you an idea for about 10 years, I was, I think 200 days a year, I used to be out of the country. That's the amount of travel I did, visited and worked in over 30 countries. And, um, two, three important lessons arrived from this journey. One was I realized, I experienced and realized that no matter what our external differences, the human consciousness is the same everywhere. We all feel joy. We all feel pain. We all love. We all laugh. Um, we all feel sorrow. Uh, we all want to be seen. We all want to be connected, you know, no matter who we are, no matter where we are. So to be able to experience this uh, practically in country after country that I visited in, you know, 
with people in corporate boardrooms to people in the community, the entire sort of, you know, spectrum. I think it was an honor and a privilege. The other thing that I learned is that um, systems and structures that are set up to benefit a few at the cost of the many cannot create joy, peace, happiness, and abundance in the long term. And a lot of things that I saw used to disturb me. And I was known as the agitator inside the corporate space because I think I continue to wear a social worker's hat even though I was doing a corporate job. And credit to the company and the leadership uh, you know, within the company at that time that they allowed people like me the free space to just to be, to express, to work, um, and to stand up for issues that we truly, truly believed in. Uh, strangely, one of the roles that the, um, you know, we played within the company um, was really to look at how we could construct dialogue spaces uh, between factory owners and workers, between industry associations and trade unions, between governments and its people. Um, so it was a very, very interesting journey of understanding how important it was to bring people together. Because we learned early on that um, usually when you don't know somebody or something, or you know it through others. So for example, all of us, see our mind is such that it gets influenced. It, it gets influenced by what we see, what we hear, what we read, what is told to us. And we have a certain image about people, about situations and so on. And then many a time when you actually go into that situation or you have an opportunity to meet those people or interact with them, you realize that what you thought wasn't completely right. And in some cases, maybe totally wrong. So we realized that a lot of issues that came up in what was the corporate supply chain at that time was really because of this issue that nobody was understanding each other, nobody was listening to each other, and everybody saw the other as, as an enemy, as an opponent, um, as somebody who was you know, against their agendas and so on. And so we were a handful of people at that time. And why I say handful, because it was really only a handful, because most people were quite comfortable being in their entrenched positions of, I am right, my constituency is right, my people are right, my trade union is right, my factory manager is right, my government policies are right, and my company is right. And so these were people, it was very easy. You bring them together and you would have explosions. That is, if they were willing to come together. I remember in my early days having gone into a meeting um, and after the meeting finished, somebody who was um, a worker rights leader, she came up to me and she said, you know, in the past, we would not have sat in the same room with somebody from a corporation. And she said, yet when I met you, I realized you're just like us. So these were all insights which you know helped me learn and help my own growth in realizing that sometimes it's all about just bringing people together as people. And so we started building very innovative programs where we would bring people and make sure that they had time and space to first connect as people. So I'll give you an example. Now these are all just insights I'm sharing with you so that you can think for yourself and see how maybe some of these principles can be used by you wherever you are or wherever you will be going to create these spaces, these safe spaces. So one of the activities that we did was traditionally US corporations didn't really want to engage with trade union leaders across the world, whether it was in Asia or Africa or Mideast or wherever, South America, anywhere. But we sort of decided to do things differently. And so we started holding these, these workshops where we would bring in our own local um, brand representatives along with the local labor rights leaders. And the first evening was just bringing them together. 
And we made sure that people from a country, so for example, if we had people from, say, uh, Bangladesh, we would have the Bangladeshi representative sitting, the uh, company, the GAP representative sitting with um, the Bangladeshi trade union leader and from Cambodia or Nepal or Pakistan or wherever, India, we would do the same thing. And um, there was no work agenda. It was just sit and have a wonderful meal, um, speak to each other. So it was interesting because many times when they sat in a large, large gathering like that next to each other, they would realize that the person next to me, even if that's a trade union leader, um, I have much more in common with him or her than anybody else around the table. So the language we speak or the food we like or our cultural context and so on. And uh, we started noticing that as the evening sort of progressed, very often they would be opening their, their wallets or their phones and sharing pictures of their family, their children. And by the time the evening was over, and of course we would add in some, you know, some music or some poetry or something artistic because that is what fine arts do. Fine arts actually open up, open up the space of the heart. And if we have to sense oneness, if we have to sense harmony, and I'm not talking about learning oneness or learning harmony, I'm using the word very consciously, sense, feel. For all of this, the heart space has to be open. So what we used to realize um, at the end of such evenings was that somehow a bond had been formed between two individuals who probably up to that point had only restricted themselves to very, very formal communication over email, or in some cases, no communication at all. In fact, you know, they would much rather just, um, you know, bring a group of people and maybe protest uh, in front of the Gap office or a Gap store, depending on where they were, rather than communicate. So this then worked, you know, resulted in one of the most successful um, stakeholder engagement strategies um, that I believe any of the, uh, at least in the apparel and footwear sector, any of the corporations had actually set up and engaged in. And this began to work out very, very well. This connection, this bonding between people who were traditionally adversary started to really work well when there were, when there were genuine crisis situations in the countries. So whether it was an earthquake in Gujarat in 2001, whether it was a factory collapse or factory fires in Bangladesh where you know, hundreds of people lost their lives, whether it was you know, um, abduction of trade union leaders in Cambodia, whether it was the end of the multi-fiber agreement, um, which meant that certain markets like Lesotho and South Africa would completely lose all their business overnight where they had 40% of people anyway, HIV positive. So in some of these critical issues, the best friends working with us were the so-called adversaries. So what had changed? What had changed? Only one thing that we had consciously taken a decision that we are going to put people first and we are going to make good faith effort and really understanding and listening and hearing what their issues were, what their pain was, what were the issues close to their heart. Many times, many times when we sat down with people, and, and this also um, includes, you know, in countries where there was civil unrest and so on, uh, Egypt and so many other places, um, you know, issues had been simmering for a long time. And I wish there had been more people who would actually sensitively listen and hear what people had to say. So this brings us to the first point I want to highlight because we're talking today about practical aspects to dialogue. The first thing is to listen with an open, non-judgmental mind. Now, this is easier said than done because most of us come into any issue um, with a certain picture already formed in our mind. And if we developed and cultivate the capacity to be fresh and new in every moment, which means when you're in the now, 
So imagine you and I, we are connecting today. And in this moment, we are only 100% fully with each other. No other stories, no other images, no other definitions, just you and I connecting and feeling this, the strength of this connection, this communication. So when you're able to do that, be 100% present with, with anybody and they trust you enough to begin to share with you. And sometimes what they share may be fundamentally opposite to what your belief system is, but you can still hold it in your heart and mind to be fair and to just listen to them openly without any value judgment. You've taken a huge step towards becoming a peace builder. People who are men or women of peace are extraordinary individuals because they have the ability while holding their own belief systems, while coming with a certain history of their own experience, in many cases having their own pain, despite all of that, they're able to hold an open and sp safe space in which another can enter and engage and share. And very often, Within that, solutions begin to emerge. Strange solutions begin to emerge, but emerge they do. And this is what I experienced, that whenever we create these kind of safe spaces for dialogue, unfortunately, in today's world, um, see the world I'm talking about uh, when I was actively involved in these kind of issues was up to 2012. So this is uh, almost a decade of, more media influencing, more social media, more noise, more noise, more noise. And the challenge which all of us face at this point is, how do you even know what is true anymore? I mean, I get some ridiculous forwards on WhatsApp and I always warn everybody, please do not learn from the WhatsApp university because it has zero accountability. Anybody can make any message anywhere doctor any video, send it out, and then, you know, 10 other people have forwarded it and you have a huge issue. But who does this? What are the vested interests? Why do they want to divide people from people? These are the deeper questions we must be asking. At the level of humanity, we are all one, you and I. And, you know, it is said by the wise ones, the masters, the prophets, the one who have seen, the one who have known, uh, whether it was, you know, Buddha or Jesus or Nanak or Muhammad or anybody, Kabir, you know, they always talk about oneness. They talk about brotherhood. They talk about there is no other. It is all I. There is only one. And yet we've got it all wrong. Why is that? Part of the reason, and I do want to share this because I, I know this is the start of this course and I think today's session two. It's very important for each of us before we begin to step out into the world and engage with the world outside. I think a very critical pre-step is first spending time with ourselves, understanding our own mind, understanding how this dualistic mind works, understanding who we are, what prompts us, what drives us, what our strengths are, where we can do with a little bit of support. Being willing to reach out and ask and open and take support. One of the things that I see sometimes increasingly so in the world today is people are so hesitant to reach out and ask for help and support. Understand this, we can only give that which we have. And we can only create that which we are. So do not hesitate and the the law of life the law of life is that the giving and receiving has to be in a constant um fresh flow it cannot be stagnant you just cannot be a giver 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 at the same time you just cannot be somebody who's constantly taking from others this giving receiving cycle when it is in perfect flow then abundance of every form begins to manifest in your life, in your surroundings, within you. So why I bring this point up is if you look at some of the greatest peacemakers that we all, the whole world talks about, whether it was Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, you know, you have so many, you can take so many other names. I, I also 
uh, bring into this group people like Jane Goodall, you know, the work she's done phenomenally over, you know, decades and decades trying to bring people, planet, environment together. So if you look at uh, each of their journeys, you will realize all of them have spent a big part, a large part of their lives just understanding themselves. Martin Luther King used to meditate and pray daily. He was very influenced, of course, by, you know, he was a minister. So uh, the teachings of Christ inspired him, as did the model that Mahatma Gandhi had set up of nonviolence. If you look at Gandhiji, I would recommend if you haven't, each of you should read my experiments with truth by Mahatma Gandhi. He was constantly experimenting and trying to find the root of who he was so that he could bring that out and express it in the world outside. Uh, similarly, if you see Mother Teresa, when she got this guidance from it within that she has this mission, she was a young girl, I think she was 19, she had no clue. She came from Eastern Europe and she landed up one way or the other in Calcutta you know, in the gutters and slums, she saw the kind of misery people hadn't acknowledged before and she didn't even know where to start. But it was that inner guidance, that inner voice, which is inside each of us, you, me, everybody. A voice which gets many times dimmed by the noise from outside. So if you remove the noise and go back to that voice, that voice is a 24-hour GPS, internal GPS, which will never give you the wrong location or the wrong route in how to get from point A to point B. So all of these people spent a lot of time with themselves to strengthen their own core inner being. Uh, those of you who read Rumi, um, you know, any anything, any mystical, um, uh, you know, uh, poetry or learnings, you'll realize that most of the masters were people who had had St. Francis of Assisi, people who had had Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, mystical experiences. And in that space, they not only understood and realized who they were, they understood the truth of, of this crazy, mad, beautiful world. And when they came back, they came back with that one understanding which is what Guru Nanak says you know there is just one a home card there's just one sat there's just one truth there's just one light they all came back with that message and when they came back their entire whether it was Jesus they came back with the mission that this is the truth this is the only absolute truth because everything else we see is relative and the thing about the theory of relativity is I may believe my part of the truth or my assessment of the truth is true. You may believe the same. And if it is different, if our assessment is different, then we meet together and we start fighting, which is kind of, I think, the history of humankind is about this partial understanding of the truth. And there's a very beautiful story which originally came out of the Jain books. You know, the Jains were one of the oldest. They predate Buddhism and in certain case, cases, they probably predate, you know, even the Upanishads and so on. So the Jains had the story, which was later on picked up actually by Rumi in the 12th century and made popular. And you would have all heard this, but I'm still going to repeat it because it's such a great reminder. It helps us understanding, understand how this world functions. So this is the story of the three blind men and the elephant. So there are three blind men and there is the elephant and they can't see the elephant. So each blind man feels one part of the elephant. And he says, well, the elephant is like a tree trunk and, you know, it's broad and wide and strong and this and that. Somebody else says, no, it's like a hose pipe. And the third person says, no, it's like a rope because he's touching and pulling the tail. And then all three of them start fighting because each of them says, no, I have experienced it. And my reality is this is how it is. And then finally a man comes who can see, who's not blindfolded. And when the man who can see comes, he says, well, um, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're all right, but you're only partially right. Actually, the elephant is much more than 
all of what you have assessed. And this is the story of us as human beings. We all have a partial understanding of the truth and we take it as the absolute. And in many times this is conditioned and then we run with those conditionalities. If you truly want to be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, a peacemaker, a peace builder, no matter where you are, no matter what the history, no matter what anyone tells you, you have to first connect with that space of clarity within. I don't think I could have done any of the work that I did all those years because it was very, very chaotic. Um, if I wasn't forced to surrender, you know, to that deeper space, to that deeper meaning and seek and ask and in many times beg for a deeper guidance because sometimes, and you will all know this because there's something that has vibrationally pulled you into this course, into this, into this space. And that, that means there is something deeper which is going to be guiding you into places where your skills, your abilities, your understanding, your capacities will be needed. And therefore, if that guidance has already started for you, take a good look while you're doing this course over the next few months. Parallelly build some one-on-one -on -one time with yourself, maybe an hour every day, where you're just sitting and reflecting and writing and assessing yourself. Who am I? What drives me? Where do I feel I'm blocked? Where do I think I need to be more open? Where do I need to love more? You see, the opposite of all conflict, conflict comes from a lack of greater understanding. Conflict comes from this limited understanding of the other, the reality. Conflict comes from what is called othering. Othering. We feel, oh, we, I, me, my community, my race, my caste, my religion, my this, that, or the other is different, it's special, and all others are somehow not quite there. This othering is one of the biggest uh, aspects of what we call Maya or the veil of illusion, where when we take birth in this, this human form, we forget that we've all come from that one space, from that one light. And so, and as I say, this somebody's screen is clicked and I can see some light above her head, I guess. So we take that as a sign. So the fact is we forget, we forget who we are. There is a veil of amnesia and the only way out of this veil is to become more aware of who we are. So if you truly want to, and this goes back to something very, very beautiful that Mahatma Gandhiji said. He always talked about um, being the change. And I used to always wonder, what do you mean being the change? What he meant by this in my understanding is, unless you become peace, you cannot manifest peace. Because the vibration of peace is a very different frequency from the vibration of conflict. And I feel a lot of structures, including in the United Nations and so on, they have either failed or have been in, you know, impactful in a limited way because they're coming with an adversarial vibration of conflict. They're not holding the aligned vibration of peace. And so when we say, be the change, be the change, be the change, when Mahatma Gandhi said that, he said, you have to first be so anchored in your own peaceful self. There is a core. There is a core inside each of us. It's a little deep because of all this noise, but it is there in each of us. And if we spend some time in just silent reflection, with ourselves, without the mobile phones vibrating, without the televisions on, you know, um, wherever you are, create a small corner where you can sit with yourself every day and ask these questions or just close your eyes and feel. Try to connect with your own hearts. Um, I realized in my own journey, and I always thought I was someone who was a heartful person. I realized that going through this crazy journey of life somewhere 
I had become so disconnected with my own core. Then when I would sit down to do my reflection, I wasn't able to feel anything. My heart had become so comfortably numb. So monitor and see, has our heart shut down? Have we built walls around us? You know, it's a, it's a very uh, normal human tendency when we go through a number of painful incidents that we begin to shut ourselves down. And we prefer then to operate from our mind. Nothing wrong with that. We need the mind. But understand this, the construct of the mind is a dualistic one. We have the right brain and the left brain. And the secret here is anything that you create from the brain, from the mind, which is not connected to the core of your heart, an equal and opposite energy gets created somewhere in the world. So you've had since thousands of years, people trying to create structures of peace, do work around peace. But almost instantaneously, somewhere in the world, an opposite energy will also emerge. An opposite structure will also emerge. And that is why, you know, we are still in this mess that we are in as the human race. So we have to go deeper and begin to create to connect and then create from our heart space and if you see the people who've been really successful and whom we sort of you know uh, worship as the uh, the models role models or epitomes of peace builders these are people who have created who have i won't say even fought but they have basically come from that place so that is why a mahatma gandhi could move a country towards independence nelson mandela after 23 or 27 years, I forget, in the jail comes out transformed completely as a man of peace. And he himself says, the person who went into the jail was not the one who came out. Something happened. This transformation, this mystical experience of the self. Same thing with Mother Teresa or with Kabir or Nanak or Jesus or anybody for that matter, Rumi. So why are these things important? Um, peace building or dialogue is not merely an activity. Creating a dialogue space or even having, you know, another event somewhere in the world to bring together peace builders, it's all good. It'll help people network, but it's not going to really create the change we want to see. If we want outer peace, we have to first understand, do we have inner peace? And if the answer to do I have inner peace, if my answer is no, then I have a lot of inner work to do. So seek guidance from the source within and the universe will begin to guide you in a way that you begin to reclaim that vibration of peace inside. Usually, you know, when children are born, they naturally love. Children have been taught how to hate how to see somebody as the other. Our journey of life, the journey to peace is about unlearning all of that that we have been taught, which sees the other as the other. So the second point here is really about connecting with your, your inner self and spending time daily in some kind of a reflection. I'll give you another tip. Um, inner reflections are usually better when you are in nature or close to nature. So for example, if you cannot go out and sit under a tree or be in a park, or maybe you can have a few plants around you, you know, wherever you sit to your chair or your, you know, wherever your cushion where you sit to meditate or reflect, have a few plants around and you'll see the oxygenation increases when more oxygenation is there certain parts of your brain begin to get more active those certain parts hold the secrets to all of the solutions that we need on this planet so getting to understand your own mind your brain your own motivations your own inner state seeking help for to create to build your inner peace all of this is going to be important before you step out into this world. The next decade, this decade, this is 2020 to 2030. My sense is, um, I could be wrong, but I think this is the guidance um, 
I have been receiving is um, it's a time where the world is going to completely change on many levels and it's already happened and I'm not talking just about the pandemic. I think a lot of the structures which were created just to benefit a few at the cost of the many are going to come crumbling, crumbling down. And we are seeing that in the financial space, we are seeing that in the social space, we are seeing that everywhere. So while on one hand we feel there is so much of destruction, always remember that crisis precedes transformation. This was another, um, you know, statement which journeyed with me through my years that always know that if you are in a crisis situation, know that some transformation is just around the corner. So crisis precedes transformation. And when there is destruction, remember that or dissolution, new space is opened up to create newer structures, better structure, more humane structures, fairer structures. However, there is one condition. Uh, Marianne Williamson, um, who is one of my favorite authors, and I would recommend her book called The Politics of Love. She's, uh, you know, she stood for the Democratic nomination in the US uh, um, earlier this year, and in the, of course had to step away. Mm -hmm. But listen to Marianne Williamson on YouTube. A lot of her speeches are there. If you go to Marianne 2020, all of her political speeches are there, but she's also a New York Times best, bestseller writer for more than you know almost three decades. And this book she's written called The Politics of Love is a must read for anybody who works in this uh, space of peace. And what she says in the book uh, and in many of her talks is, she says, it's not that people don't want peace or they don't want to do what is right. But the thing is that the people who hate do so with so much of conviction. They're so well organized. The people who love have to come together with that same kind of conviction. They have to organize as well. They have to be strong. And we all have to come together. When that happens, she says the force of love is so much more superior to the force of hate. So ever thought about why is it we are all kept divided? What would happen if I feel the majority of the people on this planet who are peace loving people, what would happen if they start seeing the commonalities instead of the differences? What would happen if they don't listen to the general media discourse on everything that's wrong with the world, but actually start looking at everything that's right with the world, right with each other. And, and create pockets of peace, whether it is in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our society, and come together. Imagine what would be the power of that, the vibration of that. I don't know if there's anybody in this group who comes from a physics or a science background, but um, um, please Google uh, Nikola Tesla, T-E-S-L-A, Nikola Tesla. And, you know, he was a futurist and way ahead of his time. And he always said that if you want to understand the secrets of this universe and how it functions, uh, just think of these terms, frequency and vibration. If you understand that everything is a frequency and everything is a vibration, peace is also a frequency. Hate is also a frequency. There are different vibrations. Think about this in your own life. Sometimes you go to places and you feel very uncomfortable and you don't know why you're actually picking up the frequency or the vibration of that place. We have this physical body, but there is an energy body which is there with all of us. And that energy body actually is not limited by space and time. So another um, thing you would have experienced is many times you're, you're thinking of somebody you haven't met in a long time and suddenly they'll call you. How does that happen? Because your energy body has communicated you know, with them. Your, your thoughts have reached them wherever they are and suddenly they will respond to that. So if you begin to understand you're so much more powerful than just the physicality that you have been convinced to believe you are, you'll begin to open yourself up to the greater, the larger understanding of existence. And so, you know, 
I felt it was important today to bring in some of these other aspects to which maybe you may not get in a, a, a very conventional course on dialogue because the problem is if we go out into the world to do anything, whether it is to, you know, do a job or run a government or, you know, educate in the education system or even in the service sector, if we get into it without really understanding ourselves, our impact is going to be very, very limited, A, and B, we can open ourselves to a lot of other influences and conditioning which take us further and further away from our own voice. And a person who has to be a peace builder has to first and foremost listen to his or her own voice. So these are sort of, you know, some of the things that, you know, I wanted to share with you. And um, um, one of the, you know, the other piece I want to speak about, and then I'll sort of, you know, really stop and open it up for questions because I feel a lot more learning happens when we begin to engage with each other. This finding the common ground, why was this the title today? Um, finding the common ground has become one of the most important things to do in today's world because we are constantly being fed a discourse which is only focused on the othering. So I want each of you to go back to your own life experiences, to your memories, to your childhood when you know, people connected in a much more organic, easier way. When the people to people connect felt good. You see, this is the other uh, limitation of virtual relationships and virtual connections that, you know, we are people with five senses. Actually, there is a sixth sense also. You know, when you meet somebody and you actually sit and have a conversation over a cup of tea, not just your five senses, but also the sixth sense, which is your energy sense, is engaged. And so much of what we um, understand about the other, whether it's a place or a person or a situation, comes from harnessing all of these senses. What happens in the virtual reality is very limited. You know, okay, today I have my video on. Most times when I do a regular Zoom call, my video is off. The only thing that people are hearing is my voice or I'm hearing their voice. How much do we really understand? Or if it is the email, well, not even the voice. It's just a few words typed out in the same font, black and white and sent out. How much do we really get to know about each other this way? This is why we see so much of stress on relationships, whether it's parents, children, whether it is, you know, a spouse or partners or even within structures, you know, office space and so on, because everyone is rushing without really taking the time out to know the other, which by the way, can only happen if we begin to know ourselves. So slow down. And I think the gift of this pandemic has been that. It's like everyone was on a treadmill and suddenly the pause button has been pressed. And so now, the treadmill is slowly come to a grind and people don't know what to do. What do we do now? We've been running in this rat race, rushing in this rat race. What do we do now? It's not been easy. Many have lost jobs. Many have had to, you know, leave their homes and cities and move back. And it's not a great situation. There's been so much of, um, uh, you know, there's just been so much of misinformation around this pandemic. Uh, so much of judgment, all of that. Um, I believe personally what this pandemic has done is it's, it's pressed that pause button and then it has brought up to our attention and to our consciousness everything that is wrong and that is unhealed so that we can consciously work on healing those issues, healing those spaces, healing those wounds within ourselves and each other, letting go of our own violence. We cannot be peacemakers if we hold any strand of violence within us. How violent are we in thoughts, in words, towards ourselves or others, in our home, in our relationships? Again, just things for you to examine. I have to do this every single day. I mean, this is an ongoing process. You know, when you're on this path, it feels sometimes as if you're walking with a mirror in front of you 24-7. 
And when you're so focused on just yourself that you have no time to point fingers at anybody else because you realize it's something that Kabir said, you know, in one of his couplets, he said that I went to the marketplace to find that who is the most, you know, who is the one who is most impure, who is the one with the most flaws. And then I humbly reached the understanding that no one is more impure than me. No one is more flawed than me. No one needs to do more inner work than me. So when the great ones who have touched that truth come back with these sort of messages, it is what we need to take seriously. So with that, I've been speaking for 45 minutes now. I will, I will stop here and uh, over to you, uh, Bezad, so that people can, you know, then ask questions and, you know, you can ask me questions uh, about, you know, anything connected with this topic or any of my experiences that I have shared. And um, also, also um, anything else, yeah, you think will be valuable at this point. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we have uh, two people now on questions. First, uh, Asharuddin. Asharuddin. Mm. And can you just introduce yourself before asking the question? Please tell me your name, where you are from, uh, why you wanted to do, do this course, and then please um, ask your question. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Asaruddin. I'm from Kerala. No, I'm studying in Jamia Mila Islamia, New Delhi. Okay. Uh, namaskaram, Yanum Nati Nana. Mansilla, very at once. Then uh, I'm doing this um, peace and conflict resolution. So I wanted to enhance my knowledge and explore more that's why i choose this course uh, and uh, my question is uh, i was just listening to your words uh, it was just a like a visual representation not just like words so uh, we have uh, talked a lot about love peace and uh, bringing people uh, together etc then uh, how could we explain the uh, idea of uh, muscular mediation in this uh, dialogue perspective? Um, of, uh, muscular mediation. Okay, so again, sorry, you'll have to explain to me the technical term. What exactly do you mean by muscular mediation? So if there's something I don't understand, I will say I don't understand. But can uh, you just tell me what you mean and then I'll Yeah, answer. yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, to bring the people in, uh, into a Table, uh, someone is uh, applying a force on a party, just like uh, America applying a force on a uh, weaker force. Come, please come and let's have a discussion. So, just applying force on a uh, weaker sure. party. Sure. So, um, literate mean. Okay, thank you. So that's a great question, by the way, um, Azaruddin. Um, you know, there are different forces. I go back to then now Newtonian physics, really. Um, one is the push and the other force is the pull. What we have seen that with, if you see how peace builders work, they usually strengthen their own pull factor so much. Um, they have a certain magnetic personality. And all the names I mentioned of people, whether it was Mahatma Gandhi, I mean, if you look at his personality, this was a man in a loin cloth with a stick, right? Who, honestly, what was his push factor? And of course, he kept talking about nonviolence. To think of the British Empire at that time, or even to think of the huge civil servants and the big lawyers, you know, the likes of Motilal Nehru and, you know, uh, the Lajpat Rais and the Maulana Azad, these are all intellectuals. Why would they come, Sardar Patel, why would they come towards this man? It wasn't the push, it was the pull factor. And this is the big thing. Why do, again, you mentioned America, so I will take it. I will not get into a discourse on America, but that's, a, that's for a longer private conversation. But really the fact is, um, you know, when you push people towards something, that kind of change is never long lasting because it's not coming from an internal wanting to be there. 
you know, you may incentivize them and say, okay, we're having a peace summit. We'll pay for you to come. We'll look after you. We'll give you some whatever, whatever, whatever. People may gather. But if there isn't that, that light, there isn't that spark, and there isn't that natural gravity that pulls you towards an issue or a person and so on, the change that gets created is, is very, very limited. And often, like I said, if it's coming from a bunch of brilliant people and sitting and creating from their mind, an equal and opposite force is already getting created. So work on this pull factor. And since you're from Kerala, read the works of people like Narayana Guru, who did amazing work on bringing, you know, people of different groupings together, you know, so there are so many in, in Kerala, you won't be short of models. Um, so, you know, understand the mechanisms of how these people operated. That's why I like your question, because usually our conventional understanding is we've got to push people towards it. The thing is, when you're applying force and pushing people towards anything, the moment the force is removed, it'll come back. But when it is a pull factor, it's a completely different dynamics. So work on the pull factor. Yes, um, Sabiha. Hello, Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, I'm Sabiha More, and I'm an associate professor for last 30 years in Mumbai. I teach in a beard college. Okay. And um, incidentally, the name of my college is Gandhi Sikshan Bhavan. So <laughs> we live, uh, we breathe, we sleep, we wear, we think, we Amazing. venture uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Oh, sorry, when I joined as a young, uh, brightly uh, woman um, in my youth days, uh, honestly, I used to hate Gandhi. I used to say why this man had to be there. But in last 30 years that I have uh, tried to understand, and yes, I have read my experiment with truth, all 166 parts that it had. It appeared in Navjivan. I have read it in English. I have also read it in Hindi. And uh, I believe that if anybody wants to become a good teacher, because I'm in a beard college, ma'am, so uh, we are concerned with teaching. So. I believe that there are two, three books that everybody has to read. And one of the book is my experiments with truth. Absolutely right. It's my observation. I'm not commenting on your knowledge or expertise that uh, uh, you remember the story of Mahatma Gandhi where he uh, stopped eating jaggery and a young boy was to stop to eat jaggery. And for that, he did 15 days penance and he said, okay, I'll stop eating jaggery and then I'll set somebody else, uh, something like that. So dialogue with self is very important. So when I'm sure when Mahatma Gandhi wanted to tell that young boy, don't eat jaggery, uh, I'm sure he had an internal dialogue with self. And then he said, okay, main khana chodunga, main dusri. such a small thing. That's very true. true. And thank you very much. Uh, you know, telling me today, it is, a, you will say, ah, why am I doing this course? Ma'am, I've already done a master's in Gandhi and peace study. I've done master's in public. I've done eight master's already. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still feel being a teacher, you have to keep learning. I am staying in an atmosphere which only talks about peace. I... Romagi, I, you know, no, normally we propagate peace, but I still feel fine ki kuch acha nahi ho hai dunia mein. nothing good is happening. So the more you learn, the better it is. That's why I joined this dialogue. And sorry, there is no dialogue, man. I'll tell you a very small example. So a rickshaw wala ki, ko ek badi SUV ne thok diya by chance in Mumbai. You know, somebody dashes a rickshaw wala. The SUV person, in spite of being on the wrong lane, will come and he will come and bash the rickshaw wala. So there is no dialogue. Who did wrong? What happened? Just because I'm more powerful, uh, I will exert my pressure on you. Know? So understanding this is very important. And that you said about Kabir, Bura jo dekhan mein chala, bura na milia koi, jo dil khoja apna musa bura na koi, we never understand. My question to you is, uh, and thank you very much for telling me that the six blind men and elephant is a story from Jain literature. Uh, sorry, so many years, we have a lesson in beard in 8th standard or 7th standard. Every year I teach this. And so very rightly, I thought that this has come from Western literature. Mm -hmm. I, I am absolutely mesmerized to know that it has come from 
uh, Jain literature. It was taken by Rumi. And thank you. I will tell my students now that it is very much our own. It has not come from Western world. You know? So ignorant we are. I never tried to find out the root of this poetry, though I've been guiding this poetry for ages. And that is what is inner dialogue that one has to do. So thank you very much for telling me that. My question is that in spite of we all knowing that power is temporary, power will come and go, why is it that powerful people don't do any dialogue with themselves? You know, A little power is given to them and their ego is inflated like anything. Uh, they forget to see humanity, righteousness, morality, ethnicity, nothing. That, uh, look, the only thing, my power, I, me, myself, what is it that makes them so full of themselves? My mm. one question is that. And second, how I teach my young students to do inner dialogue? Of course, I I see, ma'am, I stay alone. My, I have three kids. All of them are abroad. My husband stays somewhere near nature with his 2,000 trees. So, I'm, so I do a lot of dialogue. I talk to myself when I cook. I talk to myself when I'm eating. I always say, oh, Sabia, so today what will you have for breakfast? And I'll say, okay, omelette. No, yesterday you had omelette. Make something nice. So people may be thinking that I'm mad, but inner dialogue is very necessary. It makes your, this thing come. How do I teach my young students who are about 23, 24 to learn to speak to themselves? You know, They don't speak to themselves. I know for sure. sure. They don't. Thank you very much, man. Thanks okay. a lot. No, no, I have to thank you. I mean, it's an honor for me to, you know, uh, come across somebody like you because, see, this is an, and this is another point. This is not an easy path. This is a very lonely path. You know, when you are trying to swim against the current, the current, uh, you know, the current current is, you know, in, in sort of the, the Hindu space, they'd say this is Kalyug. So in Kalyug, everything that is wrong will happen and it is happening. So those of us who still come from a different space, we are actually swimming against the current. It's a very, very lonely journey. I mean, I enjoy every time Behzad reaches out to me because I remember the first time I saw him, I said, oh my God, here is somebody of the younger generation. There is still hope. There is still light. So we need each other's light and support. And Behzad, I, I will say this to you again, if I haven't said this already, you know, each of these students of yours who come into this course and others you engage, you know, set up a, a, a vibrant online community where we can, and not the formal ones, but the informal ones where we can reach out to each other. We can share our problems if we have doubts. I mean, for me, I have just enjoyed what Sabiha has shared because it helps me feel that, okay, I'm also not like a mad person in these times talking about things like love. Who talks about love nowadays? Not the Bollywood wala, but the real, the essence of everything, of all existence is this love. So thank you. It's, I, I would want us to stay connected. Secondly, the credit for this. Thank for you very much. I will. I will be connected. Thank you. So for the Jain, um, the source, the Jain source of the story, I have to mention uh, my own guru, my spiritual guru, uh, my master, is somebody called Sri M, just the alphabet yeah. M. Okay. He was born as Mumtaz Ali Khan in Trivandrum, Kerala, and ran away to the Himalayas as a young boy and met his guru, who is a great yogi of the Nath Sampradaya, mm -hmm. called Maheshwar Nath Babaji, and attained self-realization. And nowadays, you know, he, he's there. He stays in a place called Madanapalli, just outside Bangalore. And his whole message is of Manavekta or the oneness of humanity. So my master is the one who would always share the story about the three blind men and this elephant. And he said it is from the Jain sources and then was picked up by Rumi. So we are also blessed in this country that we have these amazing mystics who are still there. I feel holding a very powerful vibration. You know, in 2015, he walked went on a padyatra from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, carrying the message of oneness. So some of us were blessed to be a small part of, you know, associated with those things. And when you travel across the country, again, you realize the same thing. People are so wonderful and so loving. All we have to do is remove that layer which tells us don't trust. People are bad. This is wrong. All of that. That is the noise which 
we have to daily cleanse ourselves like we have a bath to clean our body we have to detoxify our mind from all the negative news that is sent our way it has to be a conscious choice a conscious decision that's one now your other point about um, how do i get my children to do self reflection very tough why because this is the first generation which has only grown up with gadgets and media and you know constantly the whatsapp whatsapp and snapchats and insta everything which is i feel totally made so that we never quiet in our mind and we don't connect with our source it's almost as if ki this is the way to divide the world let's do it you know but the only way to go beyond that one is ma'am have these conversations with your children and every day this is a practice you know i still do a little bit of counseling with children in schools and even colleges the first thing is start with just 5 minutes or 3 minutes get them to close their eyes and just bring their attention on their breath this is another yogic secret that when you consciously begin to focus on your breath the number of thoughts in your mind will begin to slow down so if you begin to get them into 3 to 5 minutes of doing this whenever they are with you and over a period they will realize that if they are home with themselves they can do this and actually it will bring their blood pressure down it will begin to open up other parts of the brain which are less oxygenated and when those parts are awaken then like i said the creative abilities begin to manifest so get them into a practice of just being silent and being with themselves another gift from this pandemic has been a lot of people were forced to be locked down with themselves and you know we've had a range of different things that have happened so some who have not been able to handle the solitude and the isolation and have taken extreme steps we've had other cases where there's been a lot of domestic violence but there's also been a huge number of people who say for the first time we are comfortable being with ourselves and not doing anything so this getting back home to ourselves is such a critical step so quietening our mind lessening the thoughts and turning inwards is very much a path of a seeker on the path on this way of peace this this path of peace yeah so have i answered everything ma'am yeah, yeah, yeah. in my my only that my other part was why power makes people up ah uh, yes yes i thought i was missing they don't understand that this is temporary it will go why is it like that ma'am so i will uh, you know um, give two answers one is a slightly more uh, yogic answer because yes. it yes. is to do with our energy body and with our chakra so a very simple thing is people's consciousness has to do with where the bulk of their energy resides and if we just look at and i'm just going to look at the last 20 years most of the media the gadgets the television serials the films um the serials on streaming media that we have are all to do with violence or sex or division or sensationalism all of which actually trigger your lower energy centers so when you are triggered from your lower energy centers these are the behaviors that manifest oh, okay yes. it's only so i'm giving you a yogic answer but you correct, know correct, correct, but correct. if you are consciously somebody who begins to operate from the heart and upwards you will see those are the people whose temperament whose way of talking being everything is far more gentle in fact you want to find people of peace you go into i would say you go into the rural parts of india where people have not been touched by this modern technology education model and you will just find the simple people who are very connected with the self they'll be singing songs while working in the field they're content with the very little they have or don't have they're essentially peace builders i came across a book i forget its name now which was written about 100 years ago by a britisher who was traveling on a ship to india and he has described the qualities of indians that he met 
and he said i have not come across a race like this anywhere on the planet because he used to travel a lot um such peace loving people so generous um do not get rattled by anything their hospitality is beyond you know he says what a race what a country what a nation and i remember reading that and feeling very bad i said how have we got it so wrong where are we going you know but i have a lot of hope in this the newer generation because i am with you a, i am with you man i have a lot of hope in spite of everything getting yeah. rocked i still have hope you know things will change and uh, i mean and i just may i see only one hand up bezad sir so i just take one more minute of ma'am and there time yeah there are other people who are yeah, yeah, just yeah. lower so, their uh, hands but of course can go ahead yeah uh, lakshmi ma'am i want to just share this with you because it's a dialogue thing so i'm a muslim practicing muslim being married to a non muslim okay and the best critic of my this decision is my own mother she is my mother you know and whenever she i am with her and i pray and i read the quran she is very critical saying that tumko to jannat jane ka hi nahi hai tum kyun padhti ho quran tum kyun padhti ho namaz tum kyun rakhti ho roza and you know i want to tell you that my inner dialogue always say no i have a very fair chance of going to jannat i don't know why but it keeps telling me that i being doing things uh, as a muslim does not stop me from entering uh, the gates of the jannat uh, because i always feel that uh, the 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 criteria to go to jannat is not whom did i get married the criteria to go to jannat is do you believe in the being of allah and his tenets and i think i have been believing very uh, honestly in his existence and his tenets so dialogue is and that has kept me sane otherwise my own mother being my critic i think i would have lost a lot of sanity long time ago being so critical about my existence uh, but in a dialogue helps you and uh, that's a personal uh, uh, i would say experience that i would like to share with you because i think you also share the same thing uh, we are not very radical we are more uh, more critical and logical in our understanding so this is what i wanted to say thank you very much ma'am no thank, thank you. you very much for sharing this sabiha because uh you see it is the deeper sharing which actually creates change um ashar this is the pull factor i talked about when you hear someone who sharing so openly their own truth and their own experience there is a magnetic pull you feel the authenticity you want to know the person more you want to connect with them this is the pull factor i'm talking about she's just demonstrated that you know judgment is a nature of this human existence in your case it may be because you married in another religion in some other person's case it could be because the color of their skin is is you know darker than the rest of the children i mean i know children whose mothers have been judgmental because they are not fair it could be anything this is the human mind the people you talked about people you know with power and ego and how they function that is the outward demonstration but even in homes of people there is so much of judgment from just the parents which comes towards the children so unfortunately where there is no self reflection and not a deeper understanding of the human existence you will see all of these patterns will come one way or the other so first thing is you are not alone in this and if god <laughs> is love if god is love which is what all religions say then he knows the love in your heart and that's all that <laughs> thank okay, you thank you once thank again. you thank you for making my day today thanks a lot ma'am no, no. all thanks to yes uh now abala marat abul kalam can i ask you a question oh okay so i'm sorry i couldn't answer uh, can you hear me Yes, I can hear you. Yes, so, yes, go ahead. Uh, very well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Abul Kalam Azad from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I am a secondary level mathematics teacher. Okay. Uh, first of all, I mean, you are saying that why did you join this course? Actually, I mean, I would say if I couldn't join this course, then I would not meet people like Sabia Miss. Also, I couldn't uh, get this kind of, I mean, webinar from you. I mean, I am very much pleased to meet with you. guys people like you i mean so my question is 
I mean, uh, all the, as you said, I mean, 30 seconds earlier, I mean, all the, all the religion is talking about love. God is all about love. So, I mean, let's see if I talk about the, all the religion, like let's say in Kisab, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhism, now whenever people is getting the power, it can be president, prime minister, state council or whatever. Whenever they are getting this power, why they are forgetting about this love? Even if we see the background of those prime minister, president, or the state councillor, somehow in they were one part of their life, they were also pious, they were doing this kind of, I mean, good thing. But in some part of their life, even they forgot to talk with their own country or opposition party, even they are uh, trying to make conflict with the other religion. I mean, why this violent arise from, I mean, after getting the power, this is my question. So firstly, um, welcome, very good to connect with you. Uh, I must share this with you since you're from Bangladesh, that a very large part of my, my journey in GAP was in Dhaka. So I used to, I think I must have been there 14, 15 times and uh, it's a place which is very, very close to my heart. And somehow I used to be always mistaken for being Bangla. So. I used to be a little good with the language in those days as well. So very nice to connect with you. Um, see, I, I forget who exactly said it. Somebody will know. Um, but the nature of power. You know, when power comes to somebody who has not that level of inner purity or sanctity or integrity, that power begins to corrupt. It is the nature of power. So somebody has said this very wisely, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, okay? Now the point is, this is why the great beings, like you said, who always talked about love, kept talking to us about our own inner purification. Why? Why did they keep talking about if you for example, if you look at the image of Christ or Mary, many times you will see, um, you know, there is a, if you've seen images, you know, you'll see they have a red heart, an open heart in the center. You'll see many images. What are they trying to convey? That first go into your own heart, connect with that place, purify yourself, then come out. So the people who have that inner purity, when they come out into places and positions of power, you will see that they do things very, very, very differently. In fact, most of these people, you will not even get to know them because they work silently, because they have subdued their ego. They have controlled their mind. They're doing this for the love of their work or because they have a deep connection with that divine. And there are many, many such examples. But I guess in the coming times, when your generation comes into positions of power, and you've done that inner work, you do that self-reflection, you ask these fundamental critical questions to that divine power that you believe in. And if you don't even believe in any divine power, the power of your own self, and you ask for that inner clarity, for that inner purity. And when you step out, you will begin to understand that just your being somewhere, things will begin to change positively. So there are two ways of doing things. The conventional way has been to fight against people who are not upholding peace. But a very wise being again, there is a writer, there's a writer from India, very, very well known called Vikram Seth. Vikram Seth's brother, he's won every award. Vikram Seth's brother is Shantam Seth. And there is a very famous Vietnamese monk called Thich Nhat Hanh. And if you haven't heard Thich Nhat Hanh or He's now in his 90s. I'll just, I think I have a book. I have this book called Silence from Thich Nhat Hanh. The book is called Silence. And um, he was in fact nominated by Martin Luther King for a Nobel Peace Prize. Because when the Vietnam War was happening in the 60s, here was a Buddhist monk talking about peace. But Shantam Seth, who looks after uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's work in India and used to work for the United Nations, um, he made a very important point and he realized in his own work with the UN, he said, I realized that I was fighting for peace. And there itself lay the contradiction. You cannot fight for peace. You have to be peace. So he left his UN job. He came and he started working on building peace communities. Now this, I 
heard this maybe 25 years ago once and it has stayed with me always because this goes back to and since you're a mathematician you've probably heard of nikola tesla also you know you will know that if you're not holding the vibration of peace then whatever activities you offer to the world will not come from a space of peace so what happens with say people in positions of power is that power goes so much inside they feel a sense of entitlement they feel you know if you look at history anybody who came into power and got a lot of power they almost believed that they would go on forever but you see the wheels of time change and we have seen again in history the same people then come down because they have not learned those lessons and then there are examples of countries like bhutan i want to you know place before each of you study the bhutanese model the kings of bhutan are probably some of the most enlightened rulers on the planet at this time because they have given away their power in ways that you know um are very very extraordinary they talk about the happiness index rather than a development index index which is at the cost of human happiness so there are these models and i feel and i believe and i hope that your generation when you come into positions of influence and power and everyone doesn't have to be a prime minister or a president or anything wherever you are whether you're a professor you're a teacher whether you're taking tuition for children you're still an agent of change if you're holding that vibration of purity and understanding that power is actually given to us for service but most people have forgotten that and that is why when situations improve very often the people who've struggled have forgotten what their struggles were like so i hope that's answered your question to some extent thank you uh tosi fehmed Uh, 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 hi lakshmi ma'am uh, it was nice uh, hearing you uh, my name is tausif uh, i'm from bangalore i'm an engineering uh, professional i'm a blockchain expert and a trainer as well uh, i think my question was already asked by biha ma'am however having said that you know i've been uh, uh, i've been a political uh, as well as a social entrepreneur working with lot of uh, organizations at various levels and various uh, uh, expertises as well what i see is you know at 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 a larger aspect you know uh, recently there was a riot in our in our area in bangalore this riot was just an uh, flabbergasted uh, uh, incident which happened to be something which which led to something else today i see more than 900 people being arrested and etc etc a lot of things happening more than 500 people families of those 500 people waiting the outside the police stations to to get their sons out fathers out brothers out whatever way possible we we tried everything possible through lawyers association and etc etc but at a larger aspect what i see is you know the, the the administrative level of power that people use for peace is nothing there in india i mean I, with what incident i saw see there might be different incidents and different aspects to different uh, 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 you know regions it might be a different issue in kashmir it might be a different issue in in kerala but in bangalore what i literally saw was it was real use of a power that people can use to do whatever they want convincing them for money is also not happening but it is at a larger aspect they don't believe in anything they say you know it is an option it is a time for us to prove that we have to put you down we have to put you down if we don't do it now then we will not get another opportunity so so i mean how do you uh, analyze and bring peace it's at, at such situations where people at large uneducated people at large are suffering and how do we impact them you know um this is such a practical and such a critical question and i don't think tosif right i don't think this is limited right now to bangalore tosif i think this is a global phenomena because politically we are seeing the rise of a certain very very stringent um political ideology globally you know which is 
I talked about the concept of othering, which comes from this whole, the other, you know, there is the other and the other is not this, not that, not all the rest of it. And of course, when you have othering along with the kind of propaganda that we see globally, um, these are some of the symptoms. Uh, do I get disturbed? Absolutely. Do I feel hopeless on most days? Um, what, what lifts me up? Uh, and, and you, you are in Bangalore. I would, uh, I'm going to send, uh, you know, my, my Guru Sri M's email ID to Bezat. Um, I want you to connect with him because he's done this his whole life and it, you might get some deeper guidance than what I'm able to offer, you know, uh, I would advise you to connect with him. So coming back to this, I think um, every generation is given a challenge, which is also an opportunity. So if you look back historically, um, if you take United States, for example, <clears throat> they had the slavery, you know, for, for over 250 years. And then there was a generation which fought the war, which was the, what the US Civil War was all about, right? It was against slavery. Um, and so that generation was given an opportunity for that. And then, um, you know, women were not allowed to vote. So you had the women's suffragette movement, which came up to try and right that wrong. Then you had the world wars, right? Then you had the partition in, in India. These were all, every generation had to go through some kind of a crisis which I feel every individual who becomes or connected with a crisis somehow has to go through a huge self growth process, you know, um, because when we feel helpless and hopeless and don't get easy answers, we are forced to dig deeper within. We are forced to go deeper into our faith. Um, and I, I have no shame in sharing with you that having been someone who believes in fairness and human rights and justice, you know, some of the things that I've seen in my life, um, it has brought me to my knees um, in tears, feeling terrible about how can we do this to each other? Because actually there is no other. We are just, you know, one pool of consciousness. So where I am today with this um, is that I've learned that if I have to be in this, in this space of doing work around peace and dialogue, I have to be willing to hold my own pain. I have to be willing to hold my own helplessness. I have to be willing to hold that, but not give in to it. And when I hold that space long enough, and if I'm someone who has faith, deeper faith, I go deeper into my faith, somehow the answers, the support, they will begin to come. And that doesn't mean overnight things will change because we are, you know, everything in history is cyclical. Um, I watched a number of movies recently, which were set in the late 1920s and 30s. These are just movies I found on Netflix and Amazon Prime and all the rest of it. Um, all of them showed the situation in Europe just when Hitler was about to emerge. And it was uncanny how you find, you know, sort of those forces are so active globally at this point. So we have to be aware, we have to be vigilant, but we also have to understand right now the wind is blowing in a certain way. What do you do when the wind is blowing in a certain way? You set up those structures and the foundations and connect and bring people together and give them whatever little hope and joy and let them know everybody doesn't think like this. Let them know everyone is like that, um, not like that. Tell them not to get poisoned themselves, you know, to believe in. And, and then when the direction of the wind changes as it will, then something much more beautiful will emerge. This is your personal test, Thorsi, as well as the societies and the countries. All of us are going through this dilemma at this point. And so um, rest with it. Don't numb your pain or your hopelessness or your helplessness. And once again, since you come from an engineering background and so on, maybe if Bezat sets up some kind of a community, we can keep each other inspired. Um, 
when the riots happened in Delhi, what you're saying is exactly what we've been seeing. But I was very fortunate to connect with a group of people. And in fact, I can add you into that group also. Um, yeah. It's amazing what they're doing, whether they are lawyers, legal students who are quietly working behind the scenes, helping people when this whole pandemic happened, this group swung into action, getting food out to lakhs and lakhs of people who no one else could. And so today I have so much of hope in the power of individual. And all of us were feeling there is no hope. But when we came together with each other, we realized, oh my God, there are many more like us. And that gives you hope. And so do not lose hope and, you know, do connect with, with um, 3M also. I feel. Yeah. It will be Thank you very much, ma'am. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Nitya Prakash. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I am Nitya and I'm a student of psychology and uh, specific to be a psychoanalysis. And I just submitted my uh, thesis in the you know, like JNU. Mm -hmm. And uh, I joined this course because I really wanted to, first of all, really imbibe certain virtues where I can make any dialogue, you know, with my parents or with a friend or the society at large, very value creating. Like it should really leave a very positive impact. That's my goal is but thank you so much for this uh, positive uh, and really uplifting lecture like you know you have uh, renewed us to believe in the goodness that we all humans have so ma'am my question is that you know like how psychoanalysis especially it informs us that you know human is also endowed with a lot of uh, destructive instincts and capacities you know such as anger hate greed jealousy rage and we cannot negate it in the times like this because somewhere it's very human i mean that's how i understand it so the question here is like because uh, you know even when gandhi talks about like in experiments of truth like the first three four chapters are so much about his radical confessions about how he deviated from the norms how he himself was so uh, you know perversely uh, morally deprived and he faced a lot of guilt so my question is like why do we understand anger hate jealousy as negative lower order emotions i think until unless we confront them until unless we understand that the transformative capacity perhaps lies there maybe the greed can be used for greed for knowledge you know, uh, you know, anger can be used for anger for justice. So, I mean, the question is that why do we always uh, understand humans as good or bad? Why can't we embrace everything that is originally ours? And perhaps there we'll be able to connect with everyone. That That is the whole concept of oneness, you know, that we vary in degrees, but perhaps we all are one. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. So it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, point you have raised, Nitya. And, um, you know, um, I can understand you from your, you know, with the psychology background, you're absolutely looking at the, at the way the human mind works. In fact, it's a very important point you've raised. Uh, part of the way education has been structured of, over the last few decades, it has been always about... Um, focusing only on one side of ourselves, okay? So you have to be successful, you have to be good, you have to be polite, well-behaved, this, that, or the other. And if any of the other very, very human aspects come out, you are named, you are shamed, you are rejected, boycotted, bullied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I truly believe this is, again, the manifestation of a society which has gone so away from understanding the nature of a human being, okay? So if you look at the so-called uncivilized societies, in fact, I tell the world, I said, you take me to the people who have not been touched by modern education, the Western model, and you will find happier human beings. You'll find healthier human beings. So you would have come across a very uh, popular post on Facebook about this term called Ubuntu, 
Ubuntu is this term which is used in a certain tribe in Africa where if anybody in that tribe commits some mistake, some wrong, instead of punishing, they bring that person into the center of a circle and they embrace him or her and give so much of love so that person never feels less love and does something that is wrong. I mean, talk about how therapeutic that kind of an approach is rather than punishing somebody, you know, humiliating them. And, and unfortunately, what's happened, Nitya, is in this world of technology and social media, anything which is happening like this is getting blown up. And so we are seeing the impact of that. So what happens is people then go into a space of, oh my God. So on social media, you know, you have to put out your best image you know, you have to look photoshopped or you have to look a size zero or you have, you have to use filters to brighten up your skin. Even though you're in your real life, you're struggling with a whole host of other issues. So I would say somebody with your kind of understanding would do very well to open up the space of embracing our shadows because you are spot on. If we don't, accept and understand both sides of ourselves we cannot fully transcend we cannot transcend into unity if we do not understand the mechanisms of duality and our brain is set up like that to have a potentiality for the best and unfortunately the potentiality for the worst so whatever we feed into it is what grows right so um, I would say don't lose hope, uh, create spaces as a counselor or whatever it is you plan to do to bring people in to talk about those areas, their shadows that they have never been given permission to deal with. I have two, three simple sort of, you know, uh, statements I use uh, because I told you I continue to counsel and work as a soul coach um, uh, with people. One is that um, I truly believe this. It's only hurt people who hurt people. So hurt people hurt people. So if people are not hurt, they will never hurt somebody else. So there is some unresolved pain, which tends to come out very often as violence and aggression in today's time. Because aggression is seen as power, which is seen as success. This is such a dystopic definition of success. So working with people, with families, and I think most of this starts really at home when the child is growing up with what he or she sees around or has to undergo. And so there's a lot of work that has to be done in that space. And I hope, Nitya, you will actually move into the family space because the, our first role is to work on ourselves, then our family, then we move outward into the society. If every home was to work on healing its own members, this world would be a different place. So yes, it starts from there. And I hope you do good work in that space, getting people to feel comfortable with, with their shadows, because that is very much a part of the human experience and existence on this, on this plane. So Vishal Saad. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, uh, I'm Vishal, and I did my graduation in economics from Jamia Millia Islamia, and currently I'm working as a freelance content writer. Uh, I chose to do this course because I found this course to be um, intellectually stimulating and also related to uh, the process of documenting things, writing. So that is why I uh, chose to do this course. Uh, and uh, my question, uh, I, I will come to my question, but before I would like to relate it to something. Uh, I, I was reading Daniel uh, Yankelovic, and he is also a psych, uh, psychologist. He did his studies in psychology. He taught psychology for many years. And he also went into corporate world like you. Now, relating, uh, so he, he's also a theoretician on, uh, on this subject, on dialogue. And while theorizing dialogue, he's talking that to have a dialogue, 
uh, you essentially need three conditions. And among those three conditions, one condition that he chalks out is the equality among participants, right? So uh, while um, so the one of the criticisms that comes forward uh, in um, uh, while chalking out this um, condition is that uh, the so the society is structured in a such a fashion that the inherent inequalities between the participants cannot be cast aside, like a trade unionist cannot be at par with the one who is owing the capital, owning the capital. So, uh, like now, I would like to relate it to the uh, practical approach since you have uh, begun your entire. So, ma'am, in such a situation where the people have found the uh, common ground, how can, if not, they can cast aside their in inherent inequalities altogether? How at least they can mitigate those inequalities while having those conversations, or at least can be aware that yes, there is an inequality, or inequalities do exist between the participants. Absolutely. That, that, that yep. is my question. Again, a uh, good question, uh, Vishal. Um, <clears throat> So I actually agree with you, you know, the criticism is a very valid one because I think um, any of us who lives in this world, we know that it's not structured on any equal parameter. In fact, it's a very unequally, inequitably structured world. Uh, to give you some data on this, 1% um, of people on this planet, most of them Americans, own more wealth than the rest of the 90%, okay? So what is the equality we are even talking about? And the richer ones are becoming even richer. So Jeff Bezos, for example, the Amazon guy has made so much of wealth, you know, during this lockdown period. I mean, his personal wealth has grown beyond. So what are these structures that have been set up which anyway function on inequality? So accepting that this is not an equally structured world as yet is a fundamental starting point really otherwise we'll have unrealistic expectations having said that when you for example bring the the uh, uh, it, you know you bring the context of say a trade unionist versus somebody who is the head of the industry you're right you know the power dynamics the the finances and you know everything that uh, is there at play doesn't create a very equal sort of, you know, even um, dialogue space. However, um, I think what is important at this juncture in the journey of humanity, when everything has been thrown upon open. So here is again a very interesting thing. One of the things that the pandemic has done as it has hit people across the board. It has hit the very rich, to the middle classes, to the regular people. And strangely, it hasn't hit the poor people from a pandemic standpoint. It has hit them in terms of jobs and livelihoods and you know, so many other, it has hit everybody. So here is something which strangely has had an impact across the board, which usually doesn't happen because you know, the ones who are in positions of power and strength somehow kind of make sure they stay okay. Now, coming back to your point, you see the strength, and I believe in this next decade, the answers are going to come from wherever communities of like-minded um, people are going to come together, like-hearted people are going to come together for a common goal. There is power in numbers. And I think if you look at a 1% versus 90%, and I'm just giving you financial data, you just think about the power of that 90 if they decide to come together and you know, sort of see what is a new structure we have to create because this is so inequitable. It's been terrible for people. It's been terrible for the planet. You know, this constant need to, you know, this constant greed to keep buying, creating, making sure you keep, you know, plugged into the capitalist discourse. And, you know, I'm not against capitalism per se, I work for an American brand, but you know, the way it is getting further and further structured, it's only looking at the, at the benefits of the shareholders and nobody else 
beyond that. It's not looking at people and planet in any way. So you will see that more and more people are going to come together. That's already happening because beyond a point, you know, human suffering begins to trigger people in a way that they find voices. And then when there are others to give them hope, to show them a way and bring them together, I think this entire equation will begin to shift and change. And that's what we are beginning to see in certain cases. You may be aware, you know, there was a recent Supreme Court uh, thing about evicting um, people from all the railway tracks, you know, the slums from the railway tracks, which would affect, I don't know, thousands of people in the middle of the pandemic. But people have come together and now they're sort of pausing and, you know, pushing back a little bit. And so people's power, when people begin to understand that I, even though I may be born in a poor situation, even though I may not have the so-called education, I too have the same source of power within me. That creative force that created the, this universe is inside every being, not just a rich man. It's there in everybody. And as more and more people begin to connect with that, when people like you go out and tell them, you are powerful, there is hope, don't think you're less than anybody, who knows, something might awaken. And once that awakening happens, then people cannot be stopped. All of these structures are anyway. 10 years from today, if we ever get back on a webinar like this, it will be a very different world we'll be talking about. Zia Olsen. Hello. Yes, Yaul. Good evening, everyone. And my greetings to Lakshmi, ma'am. So lecture was so nice and too much insightful actually and it will really bring peace of mind for me so, uh, and then I actually it's uh, so much uh, uh, so much devotion that I just stopped my video and just listening to your voice so uh, really uh, thankful to you for this and uh, normal uh, I am Zaul Hassan and I'm doing the PhD from uh, Jamia Milia Islamia in biological sciences and in particular fungal biochemistry. And apart from that, I am also running my own organization uh, which is working for, for uh, some, some children education and uh, promoting peace. So come with this uh, interfaith dialogues and challenges while working with uh, different communities. Uh, in my NGO work. So this, this is the motivation for me that I have chosen this course uh, because uh, dialogue is very necessary in such situation. So um, uh, having a detail and a deep understanding about the dialogue and interfaith study, I will uh, do much better in, in my in that field, in my uh, work, NGO work. So I have chosen this course. That's great. So uh, come to the uh, to my question that uh, actually the and uh, I'm also uh, happy to know that you also work in this uh, and you feel CSR and all. Uh, so uh, my question is that you have talked about the practical aspects of dialogue, right? And uh, also discussed about the things like what's at university and the current pandemic and all. Uh, so in such situation, you know that the condition of the country and uh, at the global level, the things is very much changed from the past. So, so much uh, now conflict, hatred, all these things are so much prevailing. If you uh, look at the media, the, uh, the social media everywhere, there is so much uh, conflict is there. Means no one likes each other. Even the sentiments of people are uh, deteriorated day by day. People are not, uh, don't care about the uh, something, some accident is happening on the roads. So people are reluctant towards that. They are just uh, keep uh, shooting the video. When the person, you have uh, heard about the incident that the one person um, uh, get down into the, uh, uh, in front of the lion and then everyone, no one is going 
to save him everyone is just shooting so in the, in such situation how this inner peace how will we achieve this inner peace and how will uh, uh, we promote this because you as a mentor uh, of this um, uh, peace building or something and then you uh, how will you suggest us because we all are just in one platform and uh, having a motive to uh, give something to the society so just like an advocate of this uh, interfaith dialogue and all and how how we will achieve this for the mass level and uh, fortunately we have in our team uh, like sabina ma'am which is a connecting link between the two communities right uh, in uh, as per my uh, biological background the connecting link is something which uh, connect two things uh, for example like uh, amphibians the frogs they are the connecting link between fish and reptiles like uh, crocodile crocodile uh, so just uh, uh, suggest you thank you so much Firstly, thank you, and uh, you know I want to uh, again Bezad, if you can help me. Those of them who are working actually are on the ground like this with NGOs on peace building and conflict. Uh, please send me the numbers because I want to add them into. In fact, even Sabiha, I want to add them into this WhatsApp group called Action for Change, which is doing a lot of wonderful work, and there are some very inspiring people in that group. So. when i was at an all time low i got added into that group and when i've seen the wonderful work they're doing um it just and across the country it just gives you so much of faith in the goodness you know so first thing is do not okay it's important to have information but so i still get one newspaper home and i just scan the headlines and then i leave it because i just need a little bit of information to know what's happening i do not need any more negative news so consciously first thing is reduce your understand that all of social media is manipulated you know with various agendas um if you and i that's why i called it noise but if you begin to tune into your own voice and constantly ask for guidance from there you will know every step what you have to do next what your role is what happens is when we hear negative 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 then suddenly we feel oh my voice which is talking about positive things it will have no value because there are 100 things shouting negative here so remember that see through that and move away so do not ingest negative media as much as you can yes there may be 10 people who will not even stop when there's an accident but there'll be another 500 who will give their own blood okay so mm, i've come across that there are platforms like better india better india is a news platform which i came across a few years ago on facebook and they are everywhere that's probably the largest platform in india which only shares positive news so i love to read the positive stories that come in the better india space because it tells you there's so much of humanity which is alive so subscribe to such portals and b create such portals the positive experiences each of you have which gives you hope write about it blog about it spread it everywhere on social media this was the point marian williamson was saying that the people who hate are so organized and they work with a plan those of us who are peace lovers are very happy doing our own thing but now we must also spread the word we must spread the light we must talk about all the good things that are happening and always know each of us is placed in the perfect place where we are meant to fulfill our purpose so you are exactly where you are meant to be and you will see that things will grow from there and then there will be times when you still feel helpless and hopeless and wonder why is all of this happening mm, i've realized it's best not to ask why because the reasons are so many and you know we can go into all kinds of spaces however understanding this is the situation now what is it i can do to improve it so if we bring our focus from the problem to the solution you will see things will begin to change and the last bit here is i have to say this yet again that in your generation i have met some of the most wonderful people who are actually working beyond all labels and 
categories to just join people to people, people to people. So the antidote to mass media and social media is the on the ground people to people contact. So each of you carrying messages of peace and hope in real time to real people, not virtually, is going to have a tremendous impact. If I know you and I trust you and I've had good experiences with you, not only you, I will trust the broader community. This is how the human psyche works. So be the ambassador of peace, be that ambassador of light and love and know that it's not an accident who you are where you are. Okay, so good luck with everything and we'll join those of you who want to be added into that action group because I think there's a lot of good you will see uh, in that space as well. Yes, uh, I will show you remulus, ma'am, uh, or students and they write uh, their numbers uh, to themselves. Uh, we have four more people who raised their hands. Uh, mm -hmm. Maria, Mushtaq, uh, uh, Sapna and Urusa. So, Maria first. Maria Nia. Good evening, everyone. Um, Ma'am, my name is Maria Niazi, and uh, I have uh, I have a degree in uh, like a graduation degree in mass communication, and then I completed my masters in peace and conflict from Jamia. And uh, I was working. The last organization was Lotus Valley, so I was working as a teacher over there, social science teacher. But uh, then, you know, I again came across this, um, um, I mean, this certificate course and because uh, we had studied about dialogue and, you know, conflict transformation, how dialogue plays a very important role in transforming a conflict. And during Masters, I was uh, associated with Viscom which is basically, you know, it deals with the uh, issues of Kashmir and Kashmir. So my, uh, you know, I studied Kashmir very extensively. And though most of the questions have been already asked by my fellow maids, but I just wanted to ask that, you know, uh, according to you, how much and how, you know, it is possible to incorporate all these dialogue skills when it comes to a practical scenario. Because, for instance, uh, if I say an issue like, like, you know, which is there in Kashmir, they are deep rooted issues. And, you know, it cannot be one on one, like though they have been one on one interactions, but uh, on a larger picture, uh, you know, it is it possible to have these kind of dialogue skills where it can play a major role so i just wanted to know about that like you know your views about it sure so it's interesting you bring that up because i suddenly remembered way back maybe 30 years ago when i was still in college um i'd been a part of certain dialogue processes linked with, with kashmir and there was a lot of hope at that time that you know we bring people together and if we talk and things can get better now, this is where we have to understand that so much of the problems that we see on the planet is not about people. It's about the politics of vested interests. Okay. Um, and this is a generalization I can make that people in power will never like to let go of power. And people who can get more power will not like to let go of that opportunity. It's just how the power dynamics operates you know, on the planet currently. So what is the larger solution? Is it that we stop trying? No, we don't. Because um, this is what we said. You know, if, if enough people come together with the vibration of peace, I'm not saying with the dialogue of peace. I'm saying the vibration of peace. We are very powerful electromagnetic beings. Very, very powerful. If we consciously... Okay, here's another secret. When you sit down with yourself every day, in your silence, in your meditation, visualize the perfect picture for the planet that you want to see and focus in particularly on areas where there is conflict and see the perfect scenario. If everything was good, if people were happy, if the place was healed, what would that look like? And do this every single day. Hold that vision, hold that vision. The secrets of manifestation is that energetically, if we can hold a vision long enough, and if many more can hold this vision together for a long period of time, we will manifest it into the physical plane. So this is a good time for us to use the powers of visualization along with other practical things. So 
I feel at this point, there are two earths, okay? One is the old earth, which is kind of dissolving, falling apart. We are seeing all of what is happening. But the seeds are sprouting of this, this new earth, where there will be more like-hearted people like you and others who will come together. And it will not matter to us what is the color of our skin or what religion we were born into or what food we eat, what will only matter is that we are loving, acknowledging, cherishing each other and, and all other sentient species on this planet. That time will come if we get through this transition phase. So I would say in this transition, um, instead of spending too much of your energy focused on the problem, shift your focus onto what you want to see more of. How can you make that happen? It could be the simplest of things. Maybe, you know, if you have friends who are from Kashmir or any other place, reach out to them, you know, do that confidence building, invite them home, you know, make them feel that we're all one. This, that's what I'm saying, this othering, which has been deeply fed into the psyche and Nitya will support me here. You see, the mind is actually very malleable, very pliable. You must understand this. You know, advertising agencies, they have psychologists who are trained only to tell them how they have to run certain messages for how long, how many times with what visuals, colors, lights for it to get imprinted in the brain so that, you know, you say, I have to buy RIN and not Tide. This is how media works. It's constantly playing with our mind. Oh, that reminds me, those of you who have access to Netflix, and if you haven't, please watch the film Social Dilemma documentary. It's just come out on Netflix. Please watch it before they remove it. Social Dilemma. You just see it and, and really hats off. You want to talk about hope. You have the top people in the industry who develop the social media platforms who've come out and spoken about the ills of it and I don't know how these people got the courage to do it but they've done it the president of Twitter the guy who invented the like button on Facebook they've all come out and they've said it do what social media ask your dilemma and ask your friends also to watch it so uh, the masters shared that we are going from the age of information into the age of truth which means in the time of transition from information to truth, we will probably see all that has been dark and hidden coming out first. To give an analogy, you know, in the, in the uh, Hindu system of thinking, they say that whenever um, uh, a cycle of time ends, it's called the yugas and we're at the end of Kali Yuga, right? There is a manthan, there is a churning process. And in that, all the poison comes out first. After the poison comes out, so poison was hidden for so long, then it all begins to come out. Then there is a cleansing and then there is the age of light, the age of truth. I feel we are in that period where through this churning, all the rubbish is coming out from within us, from around us. And that's why when we look around, we feel, oh my God, this is so terrible. But if you slow yourself down and silence your mind and go deeper, you will begin to see that there are a lot of these small seeds of hope which are sprouting and germinating. So nurture them. If you go back to teaching in your school, you have with you the minds of children who are in their most impressionable, malleable age. Teach them these messages of hope, spread, you know, all these. If I look back, I studied in a convent school and I'm so grateful for the teachers and the nuns we had because they always gave us positive messages. And when there were painful issues, as they were, they were not rubbished. We were in a space where we used to address and work with those issues, which is probably why I took up psychology, because I understood that if you don't understand how the mind works, in fact, human body or human personality is only a manifestation of our own inner mind. So if we don't understand you know, how the mind works, then it's so easy to get lost, which is what we are seeing. So you be that beacon of light. And again, reach out to people in real time. In these times, I'm going to say that. Reach out to people in real time, send them messages, you know, have a conversation, 
not just WhatsApp, you know. And um, you'll see that you will be placed exactly where you're meant to. And big problems, which seems so big, sometimes when the right energies align around it, as if things shift, things can just shift in one moment. So we hold that hope and we'll continue to work towards that. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'm still in touch with my friends from Kashmir. So like, uh, excellent, excellent. It's been time, but yes. Yes. So you're already doing that. You're already being the peace. You're already keeping that door open. So God bless you. Thank you. Mushtaqul Haq. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Lakshmi Madam. It was a very enlightening uh, session and I would love to have uh, some more from you. Uh, my uh, uh, contention observation as well as uh, question is that uh, it was really uh, nice to know that uh, you have been talking between uh, the haves and have not so-called uh, as you stated in the uh, earlier of your uh, speech presentation that uh, you tried to uh, initiate a dialogue between the workers and factory owners. It's something quite different because uh, we always believe that there is a certain kind of hustle between two, these two groups. And uh, as far as the uh, practical kind of examples and practices from mysticism that you shared, they were certainly uh, very enlightening. And I come from Kashmir. I am a uh, independent researcher and a teacher, and here uh, even Sufism developed its own indigenous uh, brand called the Rishiism, uh, that is was influenced by Buddhism and uh, Hinduism. So my question is that, uh, like you have stated, that we need different kinds of exercises because we witness that in our case in this group, we are a uh, privileged kind of lot. So we have uh, that kind of privilege and time. Uh, to meditate, to do other things. But what for the common people who basically, whose emotions are manipulated by politicians, even by religious leaders, and who indulge in violence, and who don't have this privilege of time, money, and material resources, but that can be invested in meditation and other mystical practices. So how can uh, they basically become peaceful? Because again, peace is a uh, process needs and needs a play. The violence needs to play. So that my question is, that you voice not a, uh, I, I, I missed I think I got most of it so what I uh, think you're asking is yeah. that how do we ask the regular people who are in the midst of conflict how do we ask them you know and don't have the material whatever benefits to meditate or do any of this that was yes, one that part. Yes. Oh, okay and the second part which I would like to address with you is what can you do in such a such a space. So um, uh, there was again another very uh, famous quote. I think this is from again Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk, who said that um, if you have time, meditate for 30 minutes. And if you have no time, then meditate for one hour. Okay. And um, this is a, it's an interesting quote, but basically what it says is, you know, meditation, I'm not talking about you know, the kind of meditation fad that people sign up for long courses. And no, I'm talking about every human being has a birthright to connect with the source that is within every human being. And especially the ones who are in areas where there is conflict. So you're talking about a geographical area, but I'll tell you as a counselor, if you come into some of the most privileged homes in the big cities, there is so much of conflict. Maybe the conflict, the nature of conflict is different, but there is so much of stress. There is so much of conflict happening within the homes of people nowadays. So this is a manifestation which is there everywhere except in different ways. Um, a very easy thing is if you are someone who has access to people and they listen to you, it is this very simple technique of getting people when they feel really, really helpless, hopeless, stressed, anxious, is to get them to close their eyes and just bring their attention to their breath. This is um, a proven, in fact, Harvard had done a lot of um, uh, tests on this to see how when we bring our attention to our breathing, our body parameters begin to settle, our blood pressure settles. 
uh, slowly, anxiety will reduce. Why I'm saying this is people in conflict need this probably more than anybody else. So how do we make it so simple that everyone breathes, right? Every human who's alive breathes and breath has no religion. Breath has no other definition. So get them to connect with their breath. That is a very simple way. If you work with children, because they are so much more open and um, you know they're able to get this stuff faster, get them into five minute modules of just sitting with themselves, feeling their emotions, because the other, um, unfortunately, byproduct of constantly being in a space of anxiety is that you lose touch with your, your deeper, finer emotions because there's so much of negativity you have grown up with. And we see this with children from war zones and so on and so forth. So just get them to sit down and relax and you know use music. There's so much of stuff on YouTube. Um, you know, gentle music, whatever is instrumental and goes straight to the heart. Because when we reconnect with this ability to drop into our hearts, we begin to connect with our source, which is very, very powerful. So I cannot give you a simple answer because it's a complex area where you are. But every human being, I believe, has a right to connect with his or her breath and with his or her heart no one can take that right away from you so start with something so simple and if it becomes a daily practice you will begin to see things will change it will change internally within people and when they turn change internally within their external reality will begin to shift the wise ones who have touched the truth tell us what we see in the world outside is nothing but a mirror the actual image is our inner reality. So what we do is we are constantly trying to polish the mirror and wo gandagi vaise rehti. it doesn't go. But if we change the image in our hearts, then the reflection automatically outside will change. And um, Carl Jung, the famous psychologist said that, that what we see outside is only a manifestation of our collective inner reality. So imagine the mess of our collective inner reality that this is what we've manifested on the planet, whether it is people, whether it's politics, whether it's ecology, whether it is, you know, financial structures, we really need to do a reboot as a human species and which has to start with connecting with our inner reality. Another illusion and, and the masters say this is we feel we can correct or change anybody else. No. We can do that only for ourselves. So as we become more and more connected internally, you'll be amazed. You'll become a powerhouse. You'll become a beacon. You'll become a man of light. Your mere presence in places will shift things for people. And I'm not saying this lightly. This happens. The more that inner light begins to flow through you, people will be pulled towards you. Guru Nanak used to travel all across. In fact, He's probably traveled all the way up to, I think, nearly Europe and then Sri Lanka and then East, wherever he went. He just had, you know, Mardana, who was his, his, um, his closest friend who used to go with him and one musical instrument. Wherever he went, people would just gather, whether they understood the language, he would be singing simple songs. They would come and sit around the fakir. What is this magnetic pull? that these great beings have. It is that they're so anchored in their faith, in their reality, in their self. So once you just work on that, and this is not a difficult thing, it just needs a certain commitment on a daily basis, things will change for you. And because of you and through you for others. The answers will not come from others. It will always come from you. Remember this. You are the answer you've been looking for. Thank you, thank you, ma'am, for writing me down. Thank you. Thank you. Was there any answer? Hi, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Hi. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, my name is Fauzia Niazi and I've done my uh, BA from Jamia Millia Islamia and I've done interior designing. And I'm currently working with Helno Grady as a communication and personality development teacher. And earlier that I was working with Teach for India. My question for you is in regards to self-reflection. 
like in today's time many people are coming out with their anxiety and depression when you are not getting that support from your family in regards to self reflection or in a dialogue how can a person then be self reflected if they are they have the anxiety they have those negative vibes going around themselves how will they self reflect themselves then sure because family according to me is a huge support so the family is not supporting in your self reflection i don't know how like like you can tell me how self reflection sure. can work sure Thank see uh, very often let me tell you family is also where we have the maximum you know karmic baggage to deal with so sometimes family structures are not as simple or as nurturing as they ought to be okay that's also a reality um having said that i would once again say please connect with me through bezad there are some wonderful people uh, counselors trained counselors who are doing free counseling at this point just putting themselves out there to provide a support system for anyone who needs you know guidance or is anxious or is depressed or whatever i'd love to connect you to them so that you can connect others who connect with you to them so there are people who are offering their service and volunteering and i'll be happy to you know provide their resources to you so that you can you know uh, share it in your network so there are a lot of wonderful people who are doing this because they're doing it as a service right now because they understand in fact i think mental and emotional health is probably the i said no everything on in this churning everything comes out emotional and mental health which has never been addressed really by this world is under the scanner like never before this is a good thing it's a scary thing but it's a good thing and there are enough people who are there to support everyone who wants that help so just stay in touch and we'll make sure that you get the resources that you need okay and don't look outside you for anything when i say outside you the help will come but it may not come from the places that you expect like family or siblings or because and also everyone is on their own journey everyone is right now anxious everyone is insecure some about their job some about the future of their children this that so when people are triggered like this you know you can't find the medicine from somebody who's himself or herself a patient remember this all this Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Finally, Rusta. Uh, um, hello. Good evening, ma'am. It was really wonderful to listen to you. uh ma'am my name is urusa and i'm from kashmir but as of now i am a doctoral student based in the uk uh my research is centered around intercultural dialogue in context of the united nations uh and my case study is jammu and kashmir so i'm precisely looking at uh intercultural dialogue between two between the two quote and quote kashmiris so that's where my research is but what my observation is and most of it has been already raised by vishal and mushtaq uh but i would like to add is that uh what i think what my i don't know if it's an observation or a question is that we have this uh, assumption of uh, participation we assume the premise of participation you know we already assume that people would be having the necessary uh privilege if that's the word you'd like to use to participate mm. or if they even feel the need to participate or if they are even aware of the need to participate because recently an acquaintance of mine she is working on uh, rural migrant labors in south asian context and precisely bihar and she has lost touch with all of her uh, interviews people she was supposed to work with they are no longer interested in the research work that she has been doing for the last 3 years i mean it's wonderful work that she has done and people are no longer interested i mean for them um, I- i'm not sure if everybody understands hindi but the answer she gets is that khane ko khana nahi hai hum aapse kya baat karenge you know we don't have we don't have food to eat what are we going to talk to you about what do we have to do with anything that you're working with so what i think it essentially it, it it just becomes a process of exclusion with the exclusion just widens the gaps which are already present there you know we are again creating a section of haves and have nots and the have nots are not have nots by choice they have never been have nots by choice but what we do this in context of enlightenment in context of introspection in context of having the 
time on hand to just sit and think like i'm probably i'm sitting here i i have a, i don't have to think about the pandemic there's good medical facilities i don't have to think about i am i'm doing something whatever i'm doing and just i have the time to think okay i'll be like oh lakshmi ma'am said something like we do the reflection form i have the time to reflect people do not have that time they don't we are excluding them it becomes a very exclusionary practice and having said that and much of what you have answered also with regards to vishal and mushtaqulak there's something that i would like to add from my perspective because since i'm working on jammu and kashmir cross border it's uh, again the premise of participation when i started it was pretty much i thought oh people are going to flock to me they would they would just love to talk about it they would everybody would want to talk about it why wouldn't people want to talk about kashmir why wouldn't people want to talk about jammu but even the vocabulary that i use right now people would say kashmir people would not say jammu kashmir and for them for me to bring them from kashmir to jammu kashmir and then to bring them in the entire cross border context it is such a tedious job to do they don't want to have anything to do with it and i feel sometimes i feel this guilt i don't know i'm like am i like excluding people more than including them because they don't see it as something which concerns them i am assuming the premise of participation i went with that assumption and that i just don't know how do we reconcile with that as researchers as students as people who just want to have a peaceful dialogue want people to come to a platform it is not i think uh, i mean one of the people has also written in the chat box that how do you translate that into something which is there on the ground because it becomes very difficult you know it just becomes very difficult to get someone who wants nothing to do with it because he does not have the time he's like he's rather busy bringing food to the table doing whatever he is doing like being a part of the corporate this new liberal world that we are part of then to listen to me talk and give my questionnaire you know why don't you tell me why why are you not aware of someone who is living in the jammu part of the pakistan side of kashmir but he's like look what are you been asking me i'm i'm just a shopkeeper i don't care what you people are doing in the uks and in the us is so you know it's just i just feel is it like more exclusionary more widening the gap what do we do no, with it no 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 i don't think it's any of that so um one of the things i've realized in my own journey is there are many parallel realities that exist on this planet okay those of us who come from a certain kind of a like you said privileged background with a certain kind of education that then gives us a certain world view uh we assume that that's how it is for the rest of the world but it is not and this is not to do with inclusion or exclusion there are two paradigms i'd like you to consider one is very very simply uh, again nitya will know this abraham maslow's um need hierarchy okay this is something we are taught in psychology it's one one of the basic concepts but something so critical abraham maslow said that there is a pyramid there's a need pyramid and the bottom line which is where most people are is the layer where they have to survive which means i need my roti kapda makan and when they are focused on that survival and then there are all of these other conflicts and then a pandemic happens and they lose their jobs and they have to migrate back to bihar and you know the factories have shut by the way my, working with migrant workers is actually one of the main work that i do right now having been with the garment industry for so long because the factory shut down and so on so they are in that lower level where they are trying to survive then as you move up the need hierarchy and i would just ask you to google uh, maslow's hierarchy he's got different different points people who move beyond survival then they will look at you know um, getting more education and you know sort of aspiring for the higher things and then when you move up uh, there is a certain uh, higher consciousness of wanting to serve or help others because you have the luxury to do that you know you've moved beyond survival and then finally at the top is this need for self actualization which is to understand the higher truths of existence and come together and so on so this is what you're doing my dear is not an inclusion or ex- exclusion you're just coming with a certain world view which is probably at the higher end of the pyramid because of who you are where you are your education and you are connecting with people who right now say we take kashmir people are fatigued 
they are exhausted they just want to live just get on with the business of living you know that so they are not able to understand these or they don't want to engage with the higher concepts because at this point it's like if we have a few days which are peaceful thank you god it's like that right and then there are some who have got out of that system and not just in kashmir anywhere you see from say rural india from the smaller towns they come into the city you talk to them oh but back home you know rural economy this and that when we do researches we also come across this there's a man whatever that is that is there i am now in the city and i want a job i want to work in a call center and i want my next mobile i want to so people are at different levels of their understanding their experience and their aspirations so part of i think what don't look at this as a success or a failure i think these are brilliant insights if you are in your doctoral research able to incorporate how there are these different realities that operate and if you truly want to engage people into a participatory dialogue process firstly they have to feel the need for it you know if there isn't a current need i'm not saying there is no need of course everybody wants peace at the end of the day but current reality is such ki let's get on with let me keep my shop open i've had to keep it shut for so long so obviously none of the larger issues that is one second is what we call interview fatigue this happens in certain pockets where there's been a, a, a spotlight on a certain issue or a certain geography for so long that people are really tired of being interviewed or are, you know they like just leave us alone ek ye bhi hota hai but you have to as a peace builder and as a researcher you have to be objective and take all of this into your stride and i'm very happy you go through the self reflective process but this is not about inclusion versus exclusion it's just about the pyramid the need hierarchy and where people are on that so if you use that paradigm to you know look at to use to address these issues and understand it you will see you're able to reach a different point and i think you could come up with something very very valuable as to why dialogue spaces don't create get created in certain places it may be because of this because the reality of the people say in the united nations who want dialogue spaces and that of the people on the ground who are trying to put food in front of their family the gap is so you know we have a, a saying that you know you have these fancy consultants who have really no clue of what happens on the ground they go in with these great solutions and a lot of money and these designations but nothing works why because there's such a disconnect so connect first with the reality of the people and build your work your research your program bottoms up instead of top down Yeah, uh, that is actually the focus of my research because my framework is essentially one that has seen a lot of success in the non-Western context. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a United Nations framework. It worked in context of the European Union, mm -hmm. but the very reason that I think I got funded for the program was because I'm looking at the non-Western context where issues such as sovereignty and self-determination are at stake, and I didn't see any. better place to look at than my own home place i mean where well, i come from very good and i really feel that you're going to find some very very interesting things stay with it don't be quick to label it as exclusion don't don't go into that space stay open and understand how these different realities shift and change and use a different paradigm and see if you know you're able to emerge with something thank you thank you good luck thank you right uh, now shabista also wants to ask a question uh, shabista hello 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 am yes, i shabista. audible yes you're audible is your video thank you lakshmi ma'am ah. for your insightful lecture it was bringing peace to us uh, my question is uh, like i am a student of international relation and area studies i have uh, done my phd from jnu so i just wanted to know like uh, there are like when we see uh, issues of conflict there are um, 
issues which are like random issues like um, the uh, like the case which ziaul hasan pointed out like you see uh, any incident on the um, accident on the ground and then you will like some of them they will come and help it but there are issues which are like lingering for a long time like conflict especially in the case of conflict um i just want to take the case study of uh, israel and palestine okay so in that case what is the means we see the normalization towards this kind of conflict we see bombing is happening somebody has been you know detained on the ground and like these pictures and these images are like so much normalized then we don't feel any kind of you know uh, um, rage anger or that kind of there's no emotions which we have uh, during you know when we see a uh, different kind of incidents happening day to day to these kind of people so in that case what would be the solution means i don't find uh, i don't feel that kind of hope in that scenario what would be your take on that thank you very much ma'am sure no thank you dear not a not an easy question to answer but uh, i will try i uh, once again remind you please read marian williamson's politics of love the reason is in that she has very clearly outlined why are there wars in these places you see the military industrial complex pretty much runs the world and the largest industry in the world is the armament industry for them to continue to profit it's important to keep conflict alive in various parts of the world so there is there are far deeper commercial and other vested you know political vested interests which keep conflicts alive in certain spaces we have to understand that that then brings us to the question of what is it we can do so in all humility where i've reached currently with that is i try i always whenever i come across something that disturbs me because i i have faith in a uh, in a god in an energy which is love and compassion and i truly believe that the human heart holds that love and compassion i pray i pray for them no matter where they are in the world because that's something i can do it's something i can actively do i pray right then if there is a situation but right now i am not in a position where say i can have a direct impact on something in the middle east but where i am if there is an issue that comes up if there is a conflict if somebody is in pain and if it is in my power to do something to help them i do it so what i have learned in my own journey is not to let the larger issues where i can't play an active role overwhelm me and make me so uh, hopeless that i actually don't do something in those spaces where i can actually make a difference so in my case personally where i can make a difference is as a part of some of these networks i mentioned you know whether it's helping you know people with food or medicine or connecting them with resources whether it's for mental health emotional health whether it is to connect some of my media friends with with people who whose voices need to be given whatever little i can do you know um, some of you mentioned jnu so there is there is this this boy who goes every day to feed 250 dogs in jnu every single day because the campus is shut the dhabas are shut these poor animals are left on their own so we support people like that you know so whatever little one can do because all of this is a part of actually our own inner healing our own inner reclamation of that space of peace so my answer is if you're someone who believes in prayer look at all of those areas where there is conflict and don't forget homes like i said all conflict actually begins from the home so focus on homes send a lot of you know prayers out to these spaces and then coming back to where you are look at what are those issues where you can personally make a difference have a positive impact so that way you know you will continue to contribute um and as your canvas grows wider 
you will know what you're meant to do next and next and next. And who knows, one day you might be standing there in Palestine and Israel and giving a talk on how peace finally came into this region. Who knows? Everything is possible. Ma'am, if your time permits, you know, we have an option. Uh, sure. So, Lilo, uh, Mirza, can move? Sure. Oh, Said is good. Hello, uh, this is Sahid Allah from Kyrgyzstan. Hello, hello. It was pleasing to listen to you. Thank you for the speech, for the uh, insights, for everything. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment on the last uh, part of your speech. Uh, the question was uh, asked by the lady. So, I, so uh, as you said, like uh, doing some, yeah. Whenever you see uh, something which uh, disturbs your mind, your heart, yeah. The least thing you can do is uh, praying. Yeah, that's it. So I, I, in this regard, I wanted to remind of hadith of the Prophet, peace upon him, Muhammad. Uh, he said, if you uh, see some wrong. And if you are capable of doing something, if you are like, if you have power, so change it with your hand. Mm. So if you can change it uh, with your hand, then say something like, try to t change with your uh, tongue, like say something, your uh, yeah, speech. And, uh, and if you are not uh, able to do that, at least uh like if it, the, the the thing is wrong thing we are uh, talking about so at least uh this uh, despise it dislike it from your heart like don't uh, disagree with the thing in your, with your heart this is the least uh you can do for your face in this like from the point of islam yeah i wanted to just uh, it, thank uh, inspired. you Thank you. Reminded me of this hadith. Thank you. It's 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 very thank you for sharing, and it's very inspiring to know um, that you know the wise beings have always pushed us because even they knew that you know some issues are maybe at this time each of us cannot change it. I mean, I know you would love to change the situation, you know, uh, wherever you are, but it doesn't happen. However, yes. Uh, not adding our energies to that which we dislike, uh, you know, making a difference where we can. And for those of us who believe in the power of prayer, then praying, praying to that higher consciousness, shift and change things. And I think each of us would have seen and experienced many such what we call miracles in our lives when we have prayed from our heart and asked for something, you know, the universe does respond to it. So thank you for sharing and thank you for being a part of this. Yes. Thank you. All right. So uh, with this, we come to the end of our uh, session at today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. and Bal, for joining us today. Your talk stimulated so many thoughts our participants' mind that they asked so many questions. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.